Okay, take it away, David. Thanks so much. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, uh, so uh, one thing uh, before I introduce myself again, and um, one thing I kind of want to answer today is what do your users pay for? Um, I've worked with small enterprises and big enterprise shops, and this question keeps coming around for me. Um, so when I think of uh, what users pay for, um, I think of going and getting coffee. Um, so mostly I'm making coffee at home these days, but uh, it's never as good as you know some of my local coffee shops. Um, not sure what it is. Maybe it's these fancy machines they have, um, their knowledge, their know-how, but it's just better. And that's something I look forward to when I can get back in travel to different conferences and different cities. But I'll come back to this and try to answer maybe how Cloud One helps answer that question of what your users pay for. So uh, I'm David Hodge and I'm an independent cloud consultant. I'm also Google certified professional cloud architect. Uh, I've used Google Cloud for many years, mostly on the app engine side. Um, and I've worked with small nonprofits, small startups, uh, large enterprises doing anything from on premise to cloud with AWS or uh, Google Cloud. So I experienced, you know, in many languages uh, from my first job doing COBOL, mainframe, uh, and to now playing with uh, Clojure. So everything in between that, uh, from PHP, mostly languages on the JVM like Ruby and Java, uh, and a tiny bit of .NET. So today I'm going to talk about Cloud Run. So Cloud Run, uh, it's a product that is fully managed uh, and it's an environment for containerized app. It's bringing serverless to containers. Uh, it, can scale automatically for you, and a concept that many services now have scaling to zero, which that means that if you're not using your instances, your containers, you can scale to zero and you don't get charged for it. Uh, one of the biggest, I think, advantages a service like Cloud One has is developer ergonomics. So what I mean by that is it's not much ops or it's no ops. And there's not many things a developer has to play around with to get into the service and start using it, which we'll dive into a little code in a second. And it's pay per use. And again, driving home that fact, it's run any lang, any library. And I think that's one of the main advantage it has versus some other services. Uh, and there's an asterisk as was next, next to a cloud uh, fully managed because there's a couple of flavors of Cloud One and uh, there's Cloud One for Anthos, which if you're doing this on-prem or running it through the GKE cluster, uh, Kubernetes cluster. Uh, just to give you an overview of kind of the input and in infrastructure, um, this is a great slide. Uh, I did the image credit down below, but as I just mentioned, we're going to be talking mostly today about fully managed. That's the boxes on the right with Cloud One, which is built on uh, Knative API uh, that gives some extra security um, and the Google infrastructure. And the more you rely on a fully managed solution, the more you can work on what arguably matters the most, your code, uh, your custom code for your customer. So the inputs are how do you get this thing going? How do you get Cloud Run platform going? It's UI, meaning the Google Cloud uh, console, uh, CLI, you know, using G Cloud uh, API or command line tool, uh, and a good friend, YAML. So for those that like to use a lot of YAML, 
and maybe the customers pay them uh, to uh, run, write, learn YAML, you can always use that as well. So if you're starting from scratch, you're trying to go, you get some customer uh, input and you want to go from you know, requirements to production. How do you go from zero to production as quickly as possible? Well, you might think, okay, this is a new service or web application. What do I need to do? Well, you need infrastructure. Uh, you need to run these things somewhere on some servers. You need to be able to deploy your code to that infrastructure. You might have hopefully different environments, dev, test, staging, production, etc. And you'll need to have configuration. Hopefully it's, it's externalized. Security, you'll need to think about how best to secure it uh, in your app as well as your pipeline. I had a great talk earlier this morning about securing your pipeline. Monitoring, after you get the code to production or your environment, how do you monitor it to make sure everything's working okay and if, when it's not, how do you ensure that you can troubleshoot it? Your logs help you. How are you going to check your logs? Do you have to set up a login framework? Do you have to you know, spin up Elf or you know, some other tool or your enterprise is paying you to create a whole solution on logging and then scale that out for your enterprise? And then finally, uh, but most importantly, your code. Uh, so with all that said, there's you know, all these you know list of things you need to do just to get your your service out there. Uh, and coming back to that question, do your users care about any of these things besides the actual service you're providing or product you're providing? Probably not, but I'll keep posing that question as we go on. So with Cloud Run, it makes it pretty simple to get up and running, taking care of a lot of the things I just mentioned. In the past, I've used things like Cloud Functions and App Engine. One of the things that is very different from those features or any other services is that I can run any code I want, any lang or binary I want to. Uh, one of the drawbacks with Abigen, uh a long time ago when I was using it a lot for Java is I had to wait on the next iteration of say the JDK that was available on Appingen in the standard environment. So if I wanted Java 11, well if it wasn't ready then I would just have to wait and I wouldn't be able to benefit from say the JDK 11. Uh, and you know, that can be a drawback. Uh, you could use you know, raw VMs and spin up the code, and that's what I call much ops. You really have to be patching, you have affinity zones, you have to make sure everything's okay. Uh, you can do Kubernetes, of course. Uh, it's good to get on the resume, but it is complex, and you see folks at enterprises finding that out you know, bit by bit as they switch from vendor to vendor, trying to figure out how to do Kubernetes and they may have a simple use case and may not even need it, or you can spin up something else. So there are other things to choose from, but I'm gonna make an argument for you know, how you can get up and running quickly you know, from zero to production. So this is another thing I keep hearing is Cloud Run, you can run anything. So it's not just for services, uh, web services, internal microservices. It could be a public API that you expose. It could be for batch jobs, scheduled jobs. It could be for websites. So it can run really anything uh, that you feel like or that you want to use it for. Uh, some concepts that we'll mention just to conceptualize what Cloud Run is doing behind the scenes maybe uh, and exposes or it abstracts a lot of that infrastructure away from you so you can focus on your code is this resource model. And this is a picture taken straight from Google Cloud uh, Run documentation, but it's showing 
you know, service A and service B, that's your two services. Every time you deploy uh, what they call a revision to cloud one, it has it noted. So like B1, B2, A1, A2, A3. Those are different revisions and they're immutable. Once it's there, it's there. You can't edit that revision. You have to deploy a new revision. If those revisions, the latest one being A3, if it's getting requests, well, then it will spawn a number of container instances. And how much traffic, how many requests it gets concurrently, uh, and the CPU and memory it uses will dictate how many container instances it spins up. Uh, service B, it's not getting any requests, there's no container instances, and you don't get charged. Um, so this all happens automatically. So if you think of, if you're just starting out, you know, like I was maybe some years ago with containers or even microservices, you think, okay, I built my microservice. Uh, how do I scale it up and down and manage traffic to it? And you know, it's kind of another level of knowledge you need to gain or service you need to bring into uh, microservices or your instances. How do I handle the traffic uh, as needed? So it's another thing you have to worry about. Um, that is taken care of in this model with CloudLab. So the concurrency model um, is that many requests can be received by the same uh, revision or instance. So many requests on the right, you can see a default parameter concurrency is set to 80. It can receive many requests and depending on what the CPU and memory is set to, you will spawn n number of instances. If it's set to say one, then there's going to be n number of container instances needed. Typically, you want to have it not set to one, uh, and we may talk about that in a second. So one of the things, you know, I talked about ergonomics, the developer ergonomics for Cloud One. Some things to know. So if you just want to have, say, I have some service, I just want to get it into the cloud, containerize it, what do I need to do? So one of the somewhat rules you have to follow is your app must listen on uh, the port. Uh, so it's an environment var variable that gets injected called port. And you know whether you're doing a Spring Boot app or Closure app or whatever server you're running, it needs to be able to listen on that port. So that's a minor thing that you need to, to look at. Uh, and your code must be stateless. Uh, so a number of these instances are going to be going up and down, and you need to have stateless uh, code for that. So your Docker file, your Docker file needs to, you can have a Docker file, although you can do things called, uh, or use something called build pack, and build pack will kind of generate your container for you if it's done in certain languages. Another thing to think about is cold starts, and if you're familiar with, say, AWS Lambda, you might deal with cold starts, and it is a thing. There are things to mitigate cold starts, which I'm going to show in kind of a lot of examples. Uh, and you're pushing your Docker images to a container registry, and a best practice of minimal IAM, you want to give whatever's running your service, your Cloud Run instance, uh, deploying it the minimal amount of permissions. And I'll mention GVisor, it's a secure sandbox. It's also included in the infrastructure in Cloud One that is just there. Um, recently, there was a CVE mentioned that allowed uh, containers to escape, uh, and that didn't affect the services that already had GVisor, like Cloud Functions, App Engine, and Cloud One. Uh, so it's another layer of security that's kind of baked in. Okay, so shifting gears a bit, uh, I recently put Cloud Run into production uh, based on a requirement or a set of requirements that was given to me by a small startup. And uh, I'll talk about kind of my 
thoughts about why I chose Quadro. So I had a client that I worked with before, small startup, uh, and they came to me with you know, requirements on the left, which they want to sell football gear for teams in the US, so small teams. And when I say football, I mean uh, soccer. So the rest of the world calls it football. So I, I like to call it that as well. Uh, they came with me, came to me to provide uh, a way to sell gear from a major uh, soccer football company and sell it on Shopify. So that was basically the requirement. So I had to take uh, their inventory from this major sports company, do some kind of transformation, basically an ETL, and uh, every so often create a Shopify format. So breaking it down to what I did to use Cloud One and satisfy the requirements of having a Shopify uh, compatible CSV that would be uh, updated every couple hours. The first thing I had to do was a hard requirement that the big uh, sports company use uh, FTP to send the files, uh, the inventory over, which had maybe 100,000 records for each product. So you can think of SKU and all the comms that typically go on with retail. So the first thing I thought about is, well, I've been looking at the language Go for a while uh, and I want to go give it a try. So before even doing anything with Cloud Run or anything else with containers, I just worked on my code, the custom business code uh, for transforming this CSV and transforming into Shopify compatible CSV, um, which included some translations, English or Spanish to English translations and the like. So wrote the Go script, iterated, tested locally, you know, set up the FTP and tested it. Then when I was done with that, satisfied that it seemed to be working, satisfying the requirements, I then looked at Cloud Run and that was probably the least uh, amount of work I have done in a while to get things set up. So I enabled Cloud Run, turn on Cloud Build to do the building and deploying, and Cloud Scheduler, which allows for every, I think three hours I have it set to go ahead, run the job, and create the new CSV, which on the Shopify side is synced with uh, the Shopify file. So it, updates the inventory for my customer. Uh, so at the end, it ended up being about 20,000 records getting processed in eight seconds and that runs every three hours. Uh, every now and then I noticed it would go up to 45 seconds and I've been looking at why that happens. It's not that big a deal, but out of curiosity, I'm looking more into it uh, because eight seconds versus, versus 45 seconds is not a big a deal for this particular client or piece of software because it runs every three hours. It just has to create a file. But it'd be good to know if it's because of the cold starts or something else in my code. It could be that to be server. So I'm um, looking to track that down. Okay, so I'm gonna switch gears here again and I'm going to go live into Cloud Run. So when using Cloud Run, uh, you know, if you're not familiar with Google Cloud, you have to enable APIs that you're using. So you have to enable Cloud Run, Cloud Build, and the other APIs. So I'm going to go through a uh, example application. Uh, I was, I've been experimenting with Clojure really dig the idea of the language. It's very different from other languages in the, that I've used in the past, and I'm curious how best to use it in, say, Cloud Run. So here's the home uh, dashboard, and you can see you know, some API requests and 
billing, how much it costs, maybe some trace, but this is just the overall dashboard that you would typically see. So if you went to services for Cloud Run, I have one service right now created and I'll create one in step by step in a bit, but we have this sample app called Cloud Run Closure. And this is an existing app uh, that has a URL. It's open to external. Uh, anyone can hit this link, and I'll hit that link in a second. And we'll look at the code going on uh, behind the scenes. So I mentioned revisions before, and this will make sense in a bit, but I have two revisions. There's a third one that's kind of grayed out. It's a placeholder for other revisions, but I split the traffic up 50-50 between these two versions. Uh, and I have a label that I created, Zen and Water Dash Nature. So that doesn't make any sense right now, but in the code, it hopefully will. I also have logs, which I'll show in a bit, and YAML. Uh, so each cloud run service you can like you said, like I said before, you can set this up with this UI. You can use GCloud uh, command line tool, or you can use our good friend YAML. Uh, and I'm not going line by line with each YAML, but this is generated for me. So I like that. that. If I want to, I can look at the YAML. And then last tab is permissions and you want to run with the minimal permissions for your uh, service. And we'll go into that. And one other thing to notice is the build history of Cloud Build, the building of my image. Uh, this example is really just building Docker image. And uh, I would be doing things like more tests and uh, linting, but this is just my example. Maybe I'll add that later. So what am I building here? So I dropped into VS Code and this is a closure application built on a tool called Pedestal and I've decided to make a web application that will show me Bruce Lee quotes. Uh, find a lot of similarities or a lot of ways that his quotes relate to software and software building. So uh, I also studied you can go for a few years. So I like looking at the quotes. So one of the things I mentioned before is as an application developer, you need to listen on the port that gets injected. So this may look a lot of little different or than other you know, applications that you've seen. Uh, how it sets it up, but it's really just looking at this uh, port, which it's that clone port, and if you can't find that environment variable, it'll just set it to 88. So this is just the server settings uh, for this dash, uh, sorry, uh, port environment variable that gets injected. So the only other thing this that's interesting about this application uh, and this is some horrible CSS, which you know that I wrote, uh, just to get the example going, is, uh, you know, it's going to create or grab a image from Unsplash. Uh, and the current version has, or one of the versions out there, revisions, has getting random pictures from Unsplash with the tag Zen. The other revision has one that's getting random pictures from water and nature tags. And we'll see it live in a second. So typically, you know, when you run the application, of course you're testing locally, and you would typically uh, you know, run it as the application or script or whatever you're building, and then you have a Docker file to, to containerize it. Um, and this one, I'm using uh, from closure as the build step and it creates a 
Uber jar, standalone jar that I rename. And then for running this, I'm using the distro list uh, container based on Java 11. Distro list is a tool or images from Google that it's a little different than other containers where it doesn't have has a lower attack surface because it doesn't have any shells. So you have to do things like use entry point with this array to kind of spell out how to do your Java jar app standalone and the name of whatever your executable, executable jar is. So that's the Docker file. And locally, what I would do to test this, um, actually just before this, I started playing with the Cloud Run extension which locally you can spin up cloud code uh, extension in VS Code and you can run it. So it's actually running right now. So I can go, looks like it completed recently and I can go to that. So locally, what does this look like? So this one local host. Okay. So I get my you know, quote of the day from Bruce Lee and it gets an image. And I think this is the Zen image maybe. Uh, so having no limitation has limitation. That's good. Everything seems to work. Users will be happy. Now this is hard to read. I might want to create a separate service to maybe cache the images if it's too slow or change or only grab images with the right contrast. So I can kind of cycle through these and just get an idea of you know, what's happening. It's a very simple app. Um, and you can notice maybe it's taking a little longer because it's getting an uh, image from, from Unsplash. So you know, going forward, maybe I want to make it easier, maybe cache some of these images uh, and make a better user experience. So I'll add a feedback button somewhere on here to say, okay, what can I improve on and uh, make this a better application for my users. Okay, so it looks good locally. Um, and even with this other endpoint, simple endpoint, it's just testing local. I just want to see that I can use VS Code to constantly update the code. And it will tell me the update was successful and I can check it. So that's local. So when I run this, to run this uh, in Google Cloud, Cloud Run, after deploying it, and I'll show you the continuous deployment, you will be able to hit the URL here. So I already had that up, but it's no different. You can see it here. So this looks good to me. And so how does it get there? So I just created a Docker container and I committed it to the code to this GitHub repo. And it's using the main branch and let's refresh this actually. Yes, this has the latest code. Um, and a few useful links here and I'll send this out later. But Cloud Run, or Cloud Build rather, it is building. I had one issue with the earlier build, but you can set it up to continuously deploy based on a based on a commit. And that's what I've done. I said anytime I push to this branch main, please deploy. And it does it automatically. Typically, uh, you would only push to main, say, after maybe you have a different branch or a fork and all the tests pass. So you can set up your build pipeline uh, in a better fashion. Uh, right now, it's just push to branch main, it'll deploy the code. And you get a sense of what it's building here. So the latest one, you can see the steps it went through. This is just the Docker build, uh, somewhat interesting, but it's more interesting if something fails so you can kind of troubleshoot it. 
there's more information. So it generates, because it's using the auto deploy, continuous deployment, it will read your Docker file or your Cloud Build YAML if you want to use Cloud Build's YAML for that to generate this Cloud Build. Um, so if you want to override it, you could, and or you can just take this out of the box and, and run with it. It depends on the use case. So it's in production, uh, quote unquote production. I have this URL. I could map it to a custom domain. Uh, it's a find a cool domain to map it to. And now that it's in production, I want to look at what's happening. So I can see some metrics down here. I can see you know, sometimes it's slow because of most likely that call to, to get the images from Unsplash. Uh, what I've also done is set a job to run, I believe, every hour to maybe help, help and this is something you can do, uh, set a job to kind of ping the service to keep it warm uh, and to mitigate maybe the, the cold start. So I'll jump into that to show how you can schedule jobs. So I even call this the cloud one example one. So I set it up to run, uh, I guess it runs every 10 minutes. Uh, the next time hasn't been refreshed. Let me refresh this. So when was the review last time this year? Two thirty last one. Okay. So you can create jobs for that. Uh, in my real case, uh, the case study I was mentioning, I had set this up to run every three hours based on when the big sports company would send us the file and we can pause and transform it. So that was not a public you know, URL, it was all behind the scenes, just a job list. So I also added uptime. So now that you're in production, you can monitor your requests. You can check uptime uh, using an alert. So I set up an alert to send me an email if anything goes down or if it takes too long. So it's a simple uh, alert. It's just using email, but I can use Slack. I can configure it to only certain zones. Maybe I only need to know about North America or USA or Virginia. Uh, zone region and uh, all the checks passed. You can see, I can take a look a little bit at the uh, latency. If I want to drill in, I could kind of look at the trace, trace list. So, off of that, I can see some of these requests pretty low here. And these are all gets on the root. Um, these are a little high, eight seconds. I can jump down into the log. Now, if I had a little more complicated uh, calls, more than one calls, maybe two or three APIs I'm still information from, I could see how that affected it. So this is also good. And again, this is out of the box. I didn't spend any, any time on this. And that goes back to what do your users pay for or what are you working on uh, to provide the value for users? Cloud Run, in a sense, provides most of this for you. You have to gain the knowledge of working with the platform, but most of the other things you need to worry about are here for you already. So, I mentioned that the labels might not make sense, but now maybe they do. Where I went into my own sanity, I could see that the latest one, I was using the tag Zen. And the label really could be anything I wanted to be. Wanted it to be. Uh, and then the previous one was wire nature. So in a sense, I'm, I can be doing A-B testing. I can roll uh, one of the revisions back. I could uh, set up the traffic in another way uh, that you know maybe I find out 
users don't like getting their pictures from Zen, I could just say, well, let's switch this to 100%. We'll switch it to 100%. And it's pretty straightforward to do that. So the other thing I had to do in the kind of the real uh, production application I was using had variables for the environment um, to get some of the FTP information, but I also used a secret manager that's another separate API that you can use to manage secrets, cycle them out, revision them, which is kind of a nice feature. Um, but you're not tied to that. You can use something else if you need to. Vault or some other tool. They mentioned a good friend YAML. It's here. Uh, if you want to look at it, um, don't recommend editing it. You don't need to, but it's good to see how YAML was created. Um, but you don't have to use that. And so, next thing I want to do is kind of go step by step. So, say you had some code and uh, you had a great idea for a service and you want to create it on top of it. You can do that in a pretty straightforward manner. Uh, I'll go ahead and create the service and I'm actually going to do this. I think there's a hello world or something app you can use. So we pick US East 4. It's coming from my backyard. It's called Hello Run. Okay, do that. We will set this to allow unauthenticated invocations. That means public API or website. Uh, if I wanted to do this uh, without authentication, I would set that up uh, as well. So container image. It's asking for a container image. So there's a demo container, but notice that my container that I created for Closure Cloud Run is here. Um, and there's a number of versions of it. I'm going to use the Hello demo container. And I mentioned developer ergonomics, and kind of that's my phrase for how many knobs and switches, or how much work do I have to do to get my app or idea to run in Cloud Run. So, I'm used to App Engine. I had some knobs to play with if we needed more resources, uh, CPU memory uh, or less, and set daily quotas uh, depending on the traffic. Uh, so here you'll see some of the parameters. Uh, I mentioned that you should be using this port uh, variable, but you can specify that port, which I'm not sure how new that is, but it's good to listen to instead of relying on a specific magic number. Um, you can even put your container commands in there, container arguments. Uh, typically, you want to use a specific service account. I just created the service account not that long ago, so I'll use that one. Um, I typically start with the defaults until I get a good idea of what kind of traffic I'm going to be dealing with. So maximum request for container, timeout, um, parameters, CPUs, you can go up to two CPUs. So this all kind of the dictates or determines how your app will scale, when it will scale based on the resource and traffic. So the minimum number, which is great that the minimum number can be zero because uh, I don't get paid when nothing's running. So I can go out, you know, today, never seen Cloud Run before and test this out. So I will create this. And it's running, creating the first revision from that hello uh, run container example. Looks like it just deployed, and we'll just go straight to we'll go straight to the live app. Okay, that was pretty quick. So that is the Hello Run or Cloud Run example that they give you out of the box to play with. So it was pretty straightforward, but now that's there, I can look at the logs, which should have at least one person or one request rather. 
Yeah, and it tells you that it's listening on port. Let's see that one get. So I can monitor this. I can dig into some details. Not that interesting, but um, just verify my emissions. And it gives a good warning uh, I think, um, as well. Hey, David, sorry. Someone was yes. saying they, they're not able to see the, their own. I can only see the Cloud Run dashboard, so I'm not sure. Uh, it looks Is like that. Yeah. I don't know. Um, are you able to see everything now? I think add none. Sure. They should be able to see I'm um, in the cloud one dashboard now. Yeah, yeah, I think we're OK. Oh, okay. sorry. Yeah, and I'll start to wrap this up because I want to kind of get some QA, but it's pretty straightforward. I probably did that hello run exactly faster than I probably would in my live audience. Um, so virtual, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, although I've done that a couple of times, so I might have glossed over a couple of things. Uh, yeah, so that was creating a service from scratch. And getting back to, uh, I'll go back into this presentation. It should be a blank screen, so well, now it's not blank screen. But getting back to the question I keep asking, uh, what do your users pay for? So maybe in large enterprises, they actually do get paid for writing YAML or doing cloud formation scripts, like that is your title or your job. Uh, but you know, if you think of like the coffee shop example, um, I don't really know exactly what they do to, to make good coffee. Um, and I don't think I really care that much, but I pay you know, my local coffee shops to give me good coffee and typically a chocolate croissant. Um, and I think that has a parallel to software that we create. It's great to know the ins and outs of say, you know, Kubernetes. I've gone through Kubernetes the hard way. I've done some of the things you should do a deep dive into the tech stack you're using, but at the end of the day, you just want the the paying you for the product that you're producing, the features that you're producing. And Cloud Run, I think, gets you there quicker by abstracting all that infrastructure away and getting you to focus solely, mostly on your custom code, your custom software. So Cloud Run, you can run anything that you can think of. My next experiment is to start playing with Closure and Raw VM uh, and see what I can do to maybe make it faster or just kind of experiment in general. Uh, lastly, I'll give away this uh, my Twitter and I'll send links to this um, GitHub and any other helpful links for Cloud One. Um, I send these or uh, show this picture as a slide like the last time I went the country, went to this great place in Toronto, great Chinese restaurant at Wilson. Um, hopefully get to visit in the next year or two, but we'll see. Um, I'll take some questions now. I'll try to dive into the question section or the Q&A. Yeah, I know. I'm not sure anyone, if you, uh, if people have questions, feel free to go ahead and post them for David. Uh, this was an awesome, awesome presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, I Thank learned you. a ton. I was Great. not at all familiar with Cloud Run, and I definitely want to get going with this. Cool. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, well, I I know that um, there are there may not be any questions, but. Uh, Feel free, everyone, if you want to go head over to the Discord channel. Um, and David, if you have a few minutes, uh, maybe pop over there to ask, answer questions that other people might have. So we'll go ahead and maybe wrap up this session. 
um, and we will get started again in a couple more minutes where we'll have Banjo who's going to um, present on Streamlit. So thanks, David, so much for your time. Uh, awesome, awesome, awesome presentation. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. All right.